Hi, friends. I'm Heather Miller, CEO and founder of social impact startup Grasshopper, talent acquisition and DEI specialist, mom of two humans and three fur babies, most under four, former professional ballet and hip hop dancer, yoga teacher, interior designer, caregiver, provider, retirement planner, innovator, social connector, and the list goes on. As you can tell from my bio, I've always taken drive to the extreme and for the most part, done pretty well juggling all of my hats. However, I say this on behalf of most of us, the past three years have been very challenging. My personal experience included moving to an unknown city, the unexpected death of my mother and the birth of my first child two weeks later, launching a startup during maternity leave, the pandemic, building diversity strategies for a global corporation in the wake of George Floyd's death, another baby, and then the icing on the cake, a layoff. I felt like I was approaching a midlife crisis with no space to do so. As a result, I've been thinking about balance and whether that's actually a thing. Join me as I speak with some amazing thought leaders and women in my life to understand how they keep the fire going and the lights on while staying sane. We'll explore drive, juggling priorities, taking no prisoners with your schedule, love and sickness, pursuing your dreams, enjoying the journey and figuring out what is right for you. We hope these conversations help you err on the side of midlife epiphany versus midlife crisis. Welcome to Balancedness. Samantha, welcome to Balancedness. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, for all the listeners out there, for total transparency, Samantha's last name is Miller, like mine. So we are sisters. We were trying to figure out whether or not we should do some like weird <laughs> reveal um uh, but decided uh decided to be slightly less weird yeah decided to be less weird but I'm sure you'll hear some weirdness coming through <laughs> on this call we're already giggling through it um so usually we start off all the podcasts with like where we met each other and um I think, it's it's there. I think we met each other I don't think it was the yeah. hospital we met each other in uh, probably our living room uh, when I was five, but uh, we could skip over that since we know that we're siblings now. And we'll start with um, you, Sam. Maybe you can introduce yourself to the community. Um, tell us like a little bit about all parts since we're talking about balance. So that can encompass career, family, party, enthusiast, as we were just talking about. Um, anything, anything that's you, tell us. I wish I was a party enthusiast. I didn't know that was an option, but I'll look into that for yeah. future. Do that as a career. Awesome. Ooh. I'm learning every day. Mm. I'm Sam. Uh, I'm your little sister. So... Um, I live in Canada and um, I'm a social worker. I've been a social worker my entire career. Um, I did many things. I started out in Texas and I worked in addictions for a very long time. I worked in severe and chronic mental health for a very long time. I um, did some hospital ER work. I did um, some federal probation contracts, which was interesting. Um, I did, I started my own private practice and then I had a baby and I closed it down and decided to move back to Canada. And I started working where I am now. So I started doing hospice work, which I had never done anything like that before. And I thought that it would be really kind of dark and depressing and I was scared um and I find it the opposite so I find it really kind of inspiring even uplifting a lot of the time I do grief and bereavement work um individual work and with clients and also group 
as well. As for like my life and what I do, I'm also a mother um, to my son and my stepson and um, our dog <laughs> who, who might enter at any moment. She likes to do that. We love uh, dogs on the podcast, so don't stress yeah. out. That's good. That's good. She's not the children and anyone else who wants to join. The more anyone that wants to visit. Yeah. Children are at baseball. I I have recently had a huge crash course in baseball, which Heather can tell you. Prior to having children, nothing in our life prepared us for that. We were strictly ballerinas. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And yeah, nothing prepared um, I love us for, music. Both for having two boys oh. and having to yeah. do all boy things. Only boys. We were in a house full. It was just girls and our father, who has two shoe closets, so there was not like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of sports <laughs> happening. <laughs> so we're learning, but I think we're rolling with it pretty well. We are. Okay, I interrupted you. Sorry, you were talking about oh, okay. aside from baseball, something else. Um, well, like I was a dancer, like you. Um, similar, not as into it as you, but pretty into it. And um, I was a singer for a long time too. Um, and we can talk. I want to talk more about at some point your, and we will, of course, talk about your bereavement. Um, work and hospice work and and how you mentioned there was like a fear around it, but you actually find it uplifting. So I think that's really special because I I think about it every day and I don't know how you do what you do and how your colleagues do what they do. Um, so I, I'd love to hear more about that. But um, I feel like um we're we're talking about balance so I want to hear more about what balance means to you and maybe you can weave in as well like some of the strategic decisions you made around your life like moving to Canada where there was more support for you when you had a son um moving away from private practice um to work for an entity rather than having to like wrangle everything that you have to wrangle as a business leader. Um, so maybe incorporate some of that, but also you, you forgot all of your, your, I mean, you're an avid runner and you're really into yeah. nutrition and exercise. So build that into when you talk about what balance means to you. Right. I did forget to talk about all of that. So I guess, you know, truly like what balance means to me and kind of in a more abstract way is to be able to have like flexibility and direction at the same time, if that makes any yeah, sense. It does. I like that. Um, yeah. Keep going. Like to be able to kind of like roll with the punches because, and I, I think we'll get into this later on. There are lots of unexpected things have happened in my life. And I think they happen in everybody's life. <laughs> um, and then also to be able to adapt and change and switch directions, but still have direction. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Are there like within any given day like there's some things for you I've noticed that are like must-haves that aren't for me for example we just spent the holidays together and like every morning you will get up and run and as much as I want to make that happen for some reason or another it's just a, a priority that slips off my list so like how do you stick true to your priorities and the things that give you a sense of balance So like kind of like one of the mental tricks I use. So so the things that do give me a sense of balance are 100% exercise running is my exercise of choice. Um, Like I have, I have to be physically active, um, which is kind of why having boys has been a blessing that works for me. It's a good match. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I have to have some kind of social interaction. Like I have, to talk to my friends or my colleagues or my family Heather and I talk quite a bit Uh, (laughs) you know my partner and I talk quite a bit Um, my kids and I talk quite a bit and um, 
you know, all of these things, like, and to be honest with you, even like at a work meeting, I'll be the one like at the end of the meeting, so I'll start like ch chatting with someone, we'll be making jokes like that. I need that. That's me. Um, how do I stick to these things? I think of them as medicine. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, like I think about my run in the morning, like it's my medicine. I need, I need that. Like I'm not, I need that for my day. Yeah, but I mean, I think you've also like built a structure around you that allows for that. Like sometimes I've got like two little children and can't like, can't just abandon ship and be like, hey, oh I'll make yeah, sure like you. my kids so are we'll older. Fall down the stairs, but right. I mean, I started young, so my kids are a bit older. Um, but honestly, I used to like pop heart in the stroller and go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, or do a really early daycare drop off and then run home from daycare and then continue from there. I just needed yeah. it to happen. Yeah. I like so that. I made it I like you stick to your convictions and thinking of it as, as medicine is, is really interesting. Um, also totally in line with, with what you do. So, yeah. um, but, I, but I want to talk about resilience and I just saw, as I was doing research, um, for this session, I saw, I think my favorite definition yet of resilience, um, and I'm going to give credit to Rowan Gray and Rowan, if you're out there, I'm going to find you and bring you on this podcast because I thought it was really um, brilliant. It was in a piece called Resilience, the Myth of Balance. And that's kind of what we're talking about here, the balance or the myth of and um, working out how people feel and think about balance if that actually exists. Um, and he says, resilience, it enables us to respond to our ever-changing situation, which is exactly what you just described as your definition of balance. And I like it so much more than the traditional um, definitions of resilience, which um, one is sort of the, the idea of recovering quickly from adversity or difficulties, bringing things back together. And the other one is like the metaphor of this, like the elastic bands, like bringing things back to shape. Um, but responding to our ever changing situation, and it's not talking about responding positively or negatively. Like we often hear in resilience, it's like, oh, you you know, you get the gold medal. You are this like resilient person who can just take anything and bounce back. I like that this was just totally neutral and talking about our ever changing situations and responding to that. And yeah. I mean, for you, how does that resonate with you? And like, what is what is resilience for you? Because I think you, as a, a therapist, as a social worker, see this um, in every day in your work. So it's something that's probably like very ever present. Whereas for me, it's it's like a concept that's very latent, but just like comes up in times of adversity when I really actually have to think about resilience. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of my work, especially because I work in hospice and then also I do grief and bereavement work is very much centered around resilience. So what I really like about this is I find that when people, and I think it's similar to what you were saying, talk about resilience, they really talk about like things that are like results oriented. And I don't like that. It doesn't work really for me. Um in my life and it does has never really worked for my clients either because like we just said things go in different directions all of the time and and we don't know when we do something what the results will be um i like the idea of of it being more of like a quality and a nature like a way that you approach your journey rather than like a destination um it's like a practice more. Yeah. If it makes any practice. sense. Yeah. A practice. I like that. Um, do you remember anything from your childhood that sort of catalyzed your building or your practice of resilience? Like, is there a time? Is there something that came up? Is there like a role that you had to play where you, um, 
realized that you were building resilience or if you look back now you're like oh that's I was I was building up my practice yeah so like you gave me this question ahead of time and I thought about it and it's actually something it's sometimes I'm going to talk about it, but it's a bit difficult for me to talk about sometimes but um I have this is another reason why running is my medicine I have ADHD but I wasn't diagnosed had what till I was like oh almost out of high school yeah I think you were like um, it was your senior year yeah and not only do I have ADHD I also have like a visual processing disorder something similar to dyslexia anyways we come from a very academically focused family and I did well in school like I so but there were there were struggles there were some things that were really frustrating for me um and hard for me and I think although the results may have been good the process was just painful and um it almost didn't make the results feel good like if even if I was getting like good grades I didn't feel like I was getting good grades what are some of the things that you remember struggling with specifically just to make it less abstract um Like if our mother could answer that question, she would say like I would do like an entire project and hand half of it in somehow and the other half would be like lost in my backpack or I would study really hard for a test and I would have studied like next week's material somehow and like (laughs) and the teacher would just be like what Sam like what are you doing and I would I would feel the same way I would be like I don't know (laughs) that's like when when Percy my two-year-old is like why did why I'll say like why did you do that and he'd be like I don't know like I don't know why I do these things and it's like yeah I mean now that you're giving me these examples I'm I'm it's like it's taking me back and and I I do realize um you know, I, I understood it as sort of like a, a larger thing you struggled with. And, and now you're kind of giving me, um, you know, more, more focus and examples. Are- I, the piece of it that really helped me build resilience is that, to be honest, our parents never expected less from me. And there were times I felt, I think, like really not good about myself. And they almost like they wouldn't have it. Like I remember once being like, Dad, like maybe I'm just not not as smart as some of the other kids. And he lost it. He was like, but it was actually it was good. He was like, like I just want to hear you cool. say that again. He was like, What are you talking about? You're not as smart. As like who? And um he 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 told me that was a cop out. He was like, That's not it at all. He was like, um, And then he actually, he got vulnerable and he said, you know that I um, almost failed physics, you know, and and our dad's a physician, like he's definitely a scientist, right? Uh, You know, um, but I'm I'm a physician and I'm a good one. Like that's not an excuse just because something is hard. It doesn't mean you're just not smart in general. And then I remember, so our mother was a teacher and she was a special ed teacher and a gifted teacher. And I remember her saying once that like, and one at one point in her career, she was teaching both a special ed class and a gifted class. And she said half the students were the same in both class. And she just looks at me and she goes, Sam, you can't have it all. You just can't have it all. So it's just kind of taught me to focus on my strengths but work on my weaknesses. Like I don't just get to say like, well, I'm not good at this, you know? And um, just trust myself to figure these things out and then realize that that's, that's also kind of normal. Everybody does to some degree. Do you wish they would have given you like a little bit of a break? <sighs> huh, that's a hard question. I don't know. You know what? As far as that goes, no, I think that, listen, we can all look back at our parents and wish they did certain things differently. That, I think our parents did really well for me. That piece I needed. Otherwise, I think it would, like, I know a lot of people that have ADHD as adults. 
other um and i i really think them it's not like they didn't give me support i had support eventually when i like i compensated so nobody knew i needed them but when i got them it was a relief um but i don't think that was them i think that was me compensating yeah yeah um and as we were preparing for this, you kept wanting to come back to the concept of our our grandmothers, and I'm kind I'm I I can see why, but I want to hear from the horse's mouth. Like, what about them signaled resilience to you, and like, why were they such role models in this respect to you? I mean, everything. So, like, our grandmother Helen, it was born in New York City but there there was just the two of them it was Ethel and and Helen and their parents both worked they were kind of like latchkey kids um she was so so smart just and like witty and just quick and funny um she was very bold and you know, like from what I know now in my career about kids that grow up the way that she did, that's, that's like, that's tough to do, to be outspoken and bold and um, engaged like, like she was. And it was normal for the time. Um, but I don't think she was kind of your average woman of her time. I think she was like extra, I think she was more um (laughs) like if you if you are a latchkey kid and you um have no one advocating for you you become bold and you become your self-advocate and that's certainly what you can what she was absolutely you can i'm not sure not everybody does true true there's other factors of course i'm sure but you can right like that is resilient but not only that like she started university when she was very young she didn't finish as many women didn't then um I remember she modeled hats to pay for (laughs) she was so cute she was I mean she was definitely the first woman in her family to go to university and it was NYU which was a fantastic school which still is a fantastic school I Um, went yeah that's where you went I know I I never made that but when I called her to tell her that I got in she started telling me about all the men she dated while she was there that's <laughs> like thanks grandma <laughs> which was was definitely her reason for pursuing the education um so then she got married very young remember yeah. and to her first husband and it was world war ii and her first husband um has a purple heart and he died yeah. in the war and she was maybe just 20 19, 20. Yeah, with a one-year-old baby child. yeah one-year-old baby but I don't remember that being like if you looked at like that you would look at her and see a sad story in any way do you remember that about well she never really talked about it as a sad story because and coming back to resilience here I think like she knew very quickly she needed to position for survival purposes she needed to position herself as a very eligible um bachelorette and she did end up finding um you know, a a second love and getting married and having three more children. And then he adopted the first child. Um, But I, I think uh, there were times when, as, as she was getting older, like I would find poems from the first husband, for example, and I would ask her about them. And there was a sentimentality o- around it and around the experience and around the fact that her first child was of a different marriage and that it was, in fact, you know, quite a sort of traumatic, sad story. But um, I think in that respect, she was really re- resilient because she she really needed to create a new story for herself um, in yeah. Well, like what you said, like what I remember about her is that it was a piece, like she was definitely, she was expressive. She was a, definitely emotional. Um, there were certain things that she didn't talk about to us when we were younger, but when we were older, she did. 
And and like you said, it was part of her narrative, but she had a full narrative. Mm-hmm. You know, there was like happy and sad and dramatic and <laughs> traumatic and all of yeah. these things, <laughs> right? Like all of it. And fashion and movies and books and food and travel and all that good stuff. And what about our other grandmother, Bobby, Bobby Dora? Bobby Dora. Well, she was tough, like was to the tough. very end. Nails. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she she was very tough. She I think she was she was different though. She was more like close to the vest and soft-spoken in a way um but as she got older I feel like she became also more vulnerable with me maybe that's just because we were women instead of girls I mean she lived a very long life she lived to almost I th- it was either like yeah days before her 97th birthday you know um and so many things about her were also resilient I don't think she got a lot of warmth yeah. um except for maybe from her sister yeah from Ruthie they were warm and, and close. from us and from and us from but I mean childhood right from her yeah. own childhood I didn't and, and mom would tell me that because mom knew her parents briefly right um that maybe she didn't get a lot of warmth. And I think, you know, her relationship with Izzy was not warm. And, um, but I'll tell you what really made me realize her true resilience. It's actually, it's something that happened more recently. And it was after her death. Um, I now, I've lived in like New York, I've lived in San Antonio, I've lived in Austin. Now I live back in Toronto where we're from and where she's from. And I actually live in the neighborhood that and that she lived in and grew up in and well not that she grew up in, but the um, my kids are now growing up here. And that I work in too, because um very much a big part of the community, because I my hospice clients I go up to see are in this area as well. Um, one of my colleagues started coming when I first got hired on came to me she had a few of her clients tell her stories about Bobby like about how so I work for right now in the Jewish community and after World War II a lot of the Holocaust survivors landed in this neighborhood and our grandparents moved to this neighborhood around the same time. Now they were not Holocaust survivors. So they, they at that time had a lot more stability and health and had a lot of clients actually mention her as somebody that helps them. That was like, monumental in their recovery and survival by doing all these little small kind of like quiet things like sewing for somebody's child and it, oh, it's really cool. and that's and cool. on like their at end of life this is what they're telling talking about um, yeah. so I think to be she didn't have it easy she didn't have a lot of warmth but then to be vulnerable and warm and caring for others that's truly resilient yeah I agree with that not to mention that like a few years before first of all she she lived on her own without assistance well into her 90s and then slipped on a rug and broke her neck in sort of her I guess mid 90s became a quadriplegic and 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 continued to um, be resilient throughout the rest of her life in an altered situation. Um, you would just say brilliant. to mom, well, I walked for 90 years. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> this is fine. And we would be like, okay, all right. All right. That's a, one way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell me about your current role. I, I just want to hear more about the day-to-day. And also, as I said, I'm amazed by 
um, your ability to be um, optimistic and, and to see this as inspiring work. And so curious about what the day-to-day -day looks like. And then also the type of people that are drawn to this role and, and why were you drawn to this role in the first place? That's an interesting story. Um, I honestly, and I've said this to my boss, like, I was drawn to this role because I was moving from Austin to Toronto and I needed, I closed down my practice and I needed an income. So I yeah. took the job. Yeah. I had no idea what I was getting into. None. I was like, all right. Like it, it was kind of like that survival part of the resistance yes. practice. Yeah. I was like, let's do it. If I don't like it, I'll figure it out later. Um, sure. I and, mean, sometimes we just have to do that. We have to like take some risks, roll the dice, see see what happens. And we can always risk. make a different decision later, make different choices. Right. Exactly. And I was like, okay, hospice work, talking about death and illness all the time. Great. Like I, it definitely was a, I definitely did not see my, I was like, this will be, I'll do that for six months till I figure out what I'm going to do. Anyways, we're over seven years later. Um, and I'm still doing it. Obviously I, something, I didn't know what I was getting into in a good way. Um, not to sugarcoat the death and dying process not to sugarcoat the grief process but honestly I I feel like we know that these things happen in the world and to be able to support an individual or a family through something so difficult um to me is meaningful and it actually just kind of makes me feel better about all the things that do happen in the world yeah uh, I mean, you are having real impact day to day. So it's, it's, I can see pretty inspiring from that angle. Trying. Yeah, <laughs> we try. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically what I do, I, um, for those of you that don't know what a hospital social worker would do, I work in community, which means um, like here in Canada, we have services that allow people to stay home and not go into hospital. Um, for end of life so they can choose to die at home um, around family and be comfortable and so as you would have a social worker in the hospital I'm the social worker that would come so I come to your home um, I do emotional support and therapy with you and your family um, and I help you plan for end of life not only your care but then even in death um, we talk about the fears and all of these things and the, the concurrent and the anticipatory grief and all of these things that happen. Um, and, um, and then the other part of what I do is bereavement work. So I work with people, um, who have lost a loved one. Um, and... I I find this this piece of my work is truly inspiring and and truly uh, motivating. Is you know I I'm with my clients when they're probably feeling their darkest, and it's kind of my job to not be Pollyanna and shine a light and say like let's look at the positive but say like more in the way we were talking about resilience before this is this is the path you're doing it the way it's supposed to be done it will change we don't know how or when but it will change and I'm here with you yeah. and we'll figure it out together yeah there must be days where you come home and you're like, whoop, like that is just, that was a, a rough one. How do you pull yourself out of that? I know you say this is rewarding and inspiring, but but there must be dark times in it as well. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of like the rewarding and inspiring piece of it is like helping like a Holocaust survivor die comfortably in their home with their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren with them there's just nothing depressing about that 
whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That's just beauty and, and how it should be. And um, so I think those experiences balance it for me. They get me through. And then the other time, sometimes things are just sad and um, they don't happen as you wanted them to happen for the client or as even they wanted it to happen. Um, yeah. And I really learned to let myself grieve. And we talk about it as a team, like, it's one thing to end therapy with a client and it's another to know like you'll never hear from them again. Um, and to, you're going to miss them. You're going to miss knowing that they're in the world in a way. Yeah. Um, I, I think I get myself through those things because I try to think of my time with my clients as a privilege to learn from them. Mm -hmm. I like that. I try to keep that with me. And then I feel like, although I've lost, I've gained. And that I can use that to help somebody else or myself. Is there a quality or a practice that you've identified that allows some of your patients to be more resilient than others at end of life or in, in the bereavement process? Yeah, that was an interesting question too. So I think like number one, honestly, for is humor. Like if you can have a sense of humor, like it, it, it really helps. And it's ridiculous. And I think like if people sat in on our meetings um, that don't talk about death and dying every day, they would just be like shocked. But oh, we need it. We need to laugh. <laughs> and, and my clients too, like they're already in like the thick of it like we have to be able to make some light um and it gives some perspective too I feel like humor is a way of of like kind of lighting a path to acceptance in a way um so I think humor is a huge one the other thing I've noticed um is altruism I think altruism, I mean, I won't get into all the the neurochemistry, blah, 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 that goes with that, but it is medicine. It does work, like you, you know. What do you those... what do you mean by that? Like give us an example of that in practice. If somebody's well, like, like any life or doing birth. something for somebody else will positively um, impact your brain chemistry. Mm-hmm. And it can be anything like you can volunteer at a soup kitchen or you could just like say something nice to like somebody in your house. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't matter what it is. It will improve the moment. Um, it will take you outside of yourself. It's part of the reason why group therapy works. Um, but it doesn't take you outside of yourself in the way of like avoidance. It takes you outside of yourself as, as a way of connecting with a piece of yourself and somebody else at the same time, like identifying with somebody. Um, so it's kind of like altruism and then vulnerability. I think being able to be vulnerable is a huge piece of resilience. Mm -hmm. Is mindfulness a good tool for building resilience? Oh yeah, I think it's absolutely necessary. You know, to be truly resilient, we have to be able to, we have to be able to kind of break and fall apart and put things back together and try things a different way. And um, mindfulness, I don't think you can do that without mindfulness because a part of what mindfulness is, is non-judgmentally experiencing your experience and being aware of your experience. And so sometimes like everything can fall apart and we can have all of these feelings and you put words on it, you say what it is and you say what's happening and then you start and you allow yourself to feel and then you start kind of putting one foot in front of the other as you do that. And then something else 
comes of it. Mm -hmm. There's something I like what you said about the non-judgmental piece as well, because um, there's something in like mindfulness and meditation around like thought dropping and sort of dropping the the judgment or the things that come up or roadblocks that come up to you, say, practicing your meditation or practicing or fully being in the moment or practicing your mindfulness. So I like the the piece of being non-judgmental in allowing you to fully experiencing experience the present. Absolutely. And so for me, I mean, I've already disclosed to everyone that I do have ADHD. So, <laughs> but I am a mental health practitioner and I do and mindfulness and meditation, the way that most people would think of it, um, might be very difficult for someone like me, right? So uh, there has to be a non-judgmental stance. Yeah. Because sometimes, like, my reality is I'm really distracted and not mine. <laughs> like, and I'm what's going on, you know? Yeah. I kind and of I try- forgot about that piece. Like, I've done a lot of research and some training in, in mindfulness as well. And I was certified by the Potential Project when I was living in, in New York. And I forgot about, <laughs> as I practice it today, I mean, I'm I'm in a period of transition where I'm learning a lot of new things, taking on a new role doing new things, working towards new goals in my business. And so, of course, there is like with any newness, any new challenge or new risk that you're taking, there is a lot of, um, I think, judgment that pops up. Like, am I doing this well enough? Um, Am I serving these people well enough? And so I love the idea of as I'm being mindful about it, just drop be just having that reminder to, to drop the judgment piece of it. Even so, but like for some people, or even I think for all of us at some times, like it can even feel judgmental to be like, you can, it's uh, actually, this is Marsha Linehan, who does like, uh, she did the modalities called DBT, but I like the way, I like one of her um, phrases in her trainings about mindfulness and about acceptance, and it's about don't judge your judging. Like, judge. like you, like I'm judging. That's a ju- like you can name it and say that's a judgment. It doesn't mean you. All, it's just gone. Like, and you're never gonna think that negative thought again. It'll come up, but you'll have practice dealing with it, right? Mm-hmm. Like you may have those feelings again. Like we're human, right? That thought process again, and it doesn't mean you went backwards. It just now you're more practiced. It, it'll pass more quickly. And are there times when people are less able to rely on resilience? Like what are the optimal conditions for being resilient? I kind of think like you there, that's like not, it doesn't make sense. Like, okay. Because you're not resilient under any optimal conditions. True. Otherwise. True. But, but I think, I think I was bringing up this question in a set in the sense of like, when we were talking about the topic of this podcast, we talked a lot about um, the idea of practice and, and building resilience over time or building conditions that allow you to be resilient. So I think that's sort of what I was getting to. Um, and so I I can imagine like if you've depleted all your resources, you're exhausted. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to talk about this. Like I've got two toddlers, I'm exhausted. I've got, uh, you know, work, I've got a startup, I've got, uh, life goals that I'm working towards friendships to resist, to, to fulfill. So I'm totally depleted and I can see that there are times when I'm not, as resilient as I would like to be. And so I I think that my thinking around this is like, how do you um, either build a practice to allow yourself to to stay at a place where you can be optimally resilient or like build up that, it's almost like grit. And I know that like grit and resilience sometimes come hand in hand, but, um, and I know it, it doesn't fully make sense, but, but, um, so I think things like, you can do to kind of put yourself in a, in a place or practice resilience on the daily to, to give yourself the best chance of being able to overcome. 
So maybe, maybe if I answer this, so I think the things that are really kind of like um, the antidote to resilience are isolation. And I mean like true, true isolation and, and kind of like a, a like a chronically traumatically stressful situation. Um, other than that, I really think it doesn't take a lot to be resilient because being resilient doesn't mean you're not a mess. Like you can be really at the worst part of your journey and and be like really resilient. <laughs> like you could be like, I haven't talked to any of my friends in six months. I haven't done this. I haven't done, I'm like a mess. Um, I don't know when the last time I showered was. <laughs> uh, but you're doing it. Like that is, you're gonna look back on that piece of your journey and be like, oh, wow. Oh, now I shower every day. That's great, <laughs> you know? Like um, the, the getting through it or the problem solving piece of it, I guess that you're alluding to, like just doing the work. Absolutely. And I, I think that we can't do anything completely alone. I don't think humans are built that way. I think we need back and forth. I think we need discussion. I think we need to say things and be heard and seen, even if we're not problem solving with somebody just saying, things even just like vent is what people you know mm -hmm. and the other thing I that really I've noticed in my practice because I work a lot with trauma um now and actually before I missed that part when I, <laughs> I I did specialize in trauma for a while is even one positive role mo model in your childhood just one like everyone else could have been terrible <laughs> but like one is all you need and even like one memorable experience of like positive mirroring of somebody seeing you as good and seeing good in you. And that's it. I think that's all people need. And just to rely on that and remember that. So like keep that, keep that close and keep sort of bringing it back to the front of your memory to have that to, to lean on. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I was being trained in eye movement. It's a descent, EMDR. It's a trauma modality that's used for people that are really having a lot of intrusive um, or dissociative symptoms from their trauma. So the people who have had, I mean, you can use it for anything, honestly, and it's great. Um, but it also works in pretty severely symptomatic times. And I remember the, and it's so true, um, the trainer like laughing after we had a discussion and being like, thank God for grandmothers. Like, you know, cause people would tell stories about just like their awful childhood, their like terrible parent. And like <laughs> the one time they went to go visit their grandmother and their grandmother like said this to them and like made them cookies and like they were making it through, <laughs> you know? Having that I'm one like, like warm, it. warm um, light to rely on. To to build on. Yeah. Um, what is your best advice for someone who's struggling with resilience? Um, try to be nice to yourself and to stop telling yourself that you're struggling <laughs> so much. You're like, we don't typically ask for hard things to happen they just happen um and we're making it through to rest if you can like rest and reevaluate and then try something new like sometimes I feel like we push so hard in one direction and maybe it's not maybe it's not the direction maybe we have to try it differently Mm -hmm. yeah don't keep banging your head against the wall right yeah yep. like you kind of have to like trust yourself and then trust your experience that like let's just do this let's try something different yeah okay well thank you I loved having you on as an interviewee and not just on the other side of um my phone uh, so this was such a, such a treat. It was such a treat to get to spend uh, an hour with you in my work life.
<laughs> it is fun. <laughs> do it again. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for supporting another episode of Grasshopper's Balancedness Podcast. If you liked it, please rate, review, and subscribe on our Apple and Spotify pages. Send me a screenshot at hello at grasshopper.com. That's G-R-A-S-S-H-O-P-P-H-E-R to enter yourself into this episode's surprise raffle. And be the first to hear about upcoming episodes and events by signing up for Grasshopper's newsletter, which can be found on our website. Happy balancing until the next time.